Do you think many people will realistically catch I don't even know how to pronounce them because I've only read that. Is it BA.1? Is that how we pronounce it? Or is it BA1? The Omicron variants. Do you know, um, how do we say it? BA1? I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, um, it's that. Okay. Do you think many people will realistically catch BA1 and then also BA2 or XE? I feel like authorities want us to think so. Thank you. Um, I'm very concerned that this thing came out of a lab and therefore is not going to abide by any of the normal rules and intuitions. So you're talking about two plus years ago, not not also maybe Omicron being com- having come out of a separate lab. Uh, it's not my that f- Omicron maybe possibly having come out of a separate lab is not required for your concern to be salient here. Not at all, and in fact, there is a way in which the weirdness of Omicron could be also a consequence of the initial laboratory uh, environment. Right? You know, in other words, you, right. You, do serial passage in humanized mice, it escapes into uh, human uh, associated mice. That's a large population. It makes changes. It returns to humans because you've increased its tropism, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, my feeling is I think I hear almost everybody trying to infer what's going to happen based on the way these things tend to behave. Mm-hmm. And the problem is. The future won't look like the past if this is the first time ever that you've had a chimeric virus emerge right. globally. It may tend it may tend to revert to a normal state. Right. But I believe we have done the worst thing that we could do, which is bridge a gap. It would not have jumped on its own. And having done so, it is now like an invasive in Hawaii. Yeah. And so anyway, I'm, I'm concerned that the rules about natural immunity, as much as we saw them reflected in early phases of this, may break down. Mm-hmm. And I don't like it. Yeah. You want to you say anything more about, about that? Well, or? Um, well, let's put it this way. We have lots of uh, pathogens that circulate by virtue of some interaction between uh, the way they produce natural immunity that isn't maybe so effective and the way they change and the inner, you know, you keep getting colds, for example, and some of that is you getting a descendant of a pathogen you've already had, which would be better if you didn't. Yep. Um, so the question is, did we fast forward the process? What did we do here? And um, again, I would um, remind and given the- people we've also talked about, not only is the tropism very, very high, but the range of tissues that are impacted by this thing is also anomalously high yeah. for reasons that I believe also have to do with the laboratory origin. And so, um, you know, what the hell, Anthony Fauci? Yeah, it's not, it's really not like anything else uh, that we've seen, that we individually have experienced. <clears throat> and certainly, that'll, and, you know, it's not. We can talk in terms of, you know, what's the IFR, you know, the uh, infection fatality rate or the, you know, the CFR compared to other coronaviruses or flu, for instance. And of course, the comparison to flu early on was uh, much lambasted and, and, um, and it wasn't really appropriate then because people were doing exactly the thing. They were conflating, like, does it have a similar um, effectively death rate? That's a simplification um, to flu or does it not? And given that we live with flu, what the hell? Why are we shutting down things over this? That's that's a question um, that then tends to let people lead people to think like, well, it's the flu. Yes, I know people die of the flu, but mostly they're very old. Is that true of COVID? Yes, but if this is, as frankly all the evidence suggests, it is a lab creation, and given that it causes sets of symptoms that are not like anything else. The, you know, the anosmia, the, the loss of smell and taste that many people experience, the lesions that some people get, the, um, like the blisters on the, I've never seen or heard directly of anyone, but, um, you know, people get on like the pads of their fingers and toes, um, the brain fog. These aren't things that you get with a cold, with other coronaviruses. They just, they're not things that you get with the flu, right? These aren't, you know, these like one-off very weird symptoms are the kinds of things you expect from the kinds of exotic tropical vector diseases, like mosquito vector diseases that we have tried to protect ourselves against in other places. So um, it's a it's a weird exotic thing that... If you're just counting deaths, um, doesn't seem to have a very high death rate, especially if you treat for it. Yeah. Um, but 
uh, what are the long-term effects of having been exposed to it multiple times if you end up with symptoms? Like, what does it persist in tissues? Does it take, does it affect longevity? This is a question that we don't hear people talking about. Yeah, or at least not very well. And yeah. I would, I, if you take the model, it's a model uh, I advanced back in the telomere days, which mm -hmm. is that every disease robs you of longevity, right? Right. Um, you know, even a common cold. The point is they don't typically rob you of very much. Yeah. Um, and if, let's say that we talk about every respiratory virus that you've had in your life, everyone robs you of a little bit because they take the tissues that you depend on for respiration and they uh, cause cells to die and have to be replaced. But... Well, but the, so the argument there though would, would be contingent on they will they will have robbed you of some life if it's those respiratory tissues that reach the end of their you know hit their Hayflick limit at first among all of your cells if that's the thing that takes this you out is exactly what I'm getting at yeah. is um, if you take every respiratory disease that you've had and you imagine they all rob you of some longevity but most people don't die from the failure of their lungs, then the point is you don't tend to see that effect very strongly, right? right? It's right. there. But in the case of something like SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. which impacts many, many tissues, and the argument that I've put forward before is that that's because if you give this disease to a bunch of ferrets in a cage in a laboratory, they don't have to keep functioning well as ferrets in order to spread it, unlike a wild disease that has to keep its host healthy enough to, to succeed. So mm -hmm. the anosmia in particular um, is conspicuous because a ferret that can't smell probably starves to death. So the point is, but a ferret in a cage doesn't need to smell in order to find its chow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we may have created symptoms that wouldn't accompany an ordinary disease. But the point is, if the thing is damaging lots of tissues around the body, right, then the point is it's not like a respiratory virus where you have to ultimately die of the failure of your lungs in order to see the effect it's had on your longevity. Mm -hmm. The point is if it's expiring, you know, a little bit of liver, a little bit of, I don't know what tissues it's affecting, but many, many right. tissues by virtue of the way it inter interfaces with circulation. And the point is, well, you're going to die of the failure of one of those things, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Right. And if you do, you know, you don't have to. Cancer is sort of the opposite of the failure of these systems, but you're very likely to die from the failure of some system, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be something like half of deaths that are not the result of trauma. Right. Um, so if that's the case, then the chances that it will have burned some of the longevity you had in that tissue are high, which means that the effect on longevity is going to be much more widespread. Right. And that's associated with the prediction that there will be an increase in cancers across many systems. It, so it also seems to be somehow liberating cancers that people had that were functioning very slowly or things that were prototumors and things like that. So you basically have cancer and failure of an organ as opposite failure modes. Right. And both of these things seem to be impacted mm -hmm. um, by this disease. So anyway, it's a very it's a very frightening disease. Okay. I did want to correct one thing though. You said the yes. loss of taste and smell. Mm -hmm. Now, absolutely people lose their sense of smell, but I think a lot of the people who say they've lost their sense of taste never had taste in the first place. Oh, okay. I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to a wonderful woman this week who, who um, I assure you did, and she now has it again. Um, but did in fact lose both, and she had taste in both senses of the word. Really? Yes. Oh. Yes. That's a, like it's like a redundant backup sense of taste. Yeah. yeah. Um, no. no. No, not at all. Different. No. Different. Totally different. Same spellings. It's spelled it. 